The Tom Woods Show, episode 1529. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Folks, the great and heroic Bob Murphy has a brand new book out, Contra Krugman, Smashing the Errors of America's Most Famous Keynesian. This thing is going to give you a ton of intellectual ammunition. Check it out at ContraKrugmanBook.com. And I am the narrator of the audiobook version. How about that? You can get that for free through the Audible offer at TomWoodsAudio.com. At any rate, get all the details at ContraKrugmanBook.com. Hey everybody, Tom Woods here, delighted to welcome back Lou Rockwell to the program. Before we get to Lou, a quick reminder for the new listeners to the program, and that is I have helped hundreds and probably thousands of people start websites of their own and also get them free publicity for those sites. You start your own website, the problem is, no matter how beautiful it is, if you launch it and all you get is tumbleweeds, it doesn't do you any good. You have to get people over there looking at it. And I got people listening to my show. You need people. It's a match made in heaven. So if you get your web hosting through my link, not only do you get a really good deal on web hosting, but I'll promote your website for you right here on this program. And I'll give you a membership in my private bloggers group where we help each other when we have tech issues or just need a helping hand on one thing or another, plus some tutorials that'll help get you up and running uh, super fast. So it's a great package of bonuses. It doesn't cost you anything. Just get your hosting through my link and I will help make sure it's not just tumbleweeds going by, but it's a flock of interested, targeted traffic coming your way when you launch it. So if you want the details on that, head over to tomwoods.com slash publicity. Now, most of you folks will know Lou Rockwell already, but in case there is anybody out there who does not, Lou is the founder and chairman of the Mises Institute. He is the publisher of lourockwell.com, which publishes uh, six times a week. The uh, weekend edition runs for the whole weekend, so six times a week. And he's former chief of staff to Ron Paul. He's the author of numerous books, and we're going to be talking about his most recent one, Against the Left, a Rothbardian Libertarianism. Lou, welcome back. Tom, great to be with you. Now, this is a provocative book and title. And I think with a title like that, You have to justify yourself. What is it about the left that means they deserve particular treatment when it could be argued that we have enemies all around? Well, of course, it's true, and there's things wrong with the right as well. But uh, I would say that there's no question that the left is the preeminent danger and uh, despicable evil of our time. And uh, really, ever since uh, Karl Marx, ever since really the French Revolution, the left has been the enemy. And um, so I think it's important to recognize that. And it's, uh, I think it's all around us. And in this book, and it's not a long book, it's just 157 pages uh, with a wonderful introduction by Hans Hoppe. And um, uh, I try to talk about, you know, why this is something that we need to worry about. Uh, And these are people who want to destroy our society. They want to destroy the family. They want to... uh, promote policies like egalitarianism and, uh, you know, so-called civil rights, immigration, environmentalism, uh, egalitarianism. I mean, every, and then we have the, in our own uh, little movement, we have the left libertarians who are not anywhere near as dangerous as the, the, the left itself, but they do damage in to the libertarian movement. So I think these are all worth considering. And I think this, I think and hope this book makes the case that these are people that we need to worry about. And to oppose. I've given this a lot of thought myself as somebody who has written against pretty much everybody. You know, I've, <laughs> I've, I, you know, for a long time, I was like for, for almost the whole Obama administration. I think I was only attacking the neocons because I thought how boring to attack this is basically establishment center left president. It's just boring. Everybody's attacking him. I want to go after the neocons. You know, so I did that. And then the left just got to be so grotesque. I had forgotten how bad the left was after <laughs> going after the neocons for so long. Although and then I had to... Aren't the, aren't the neocons also on the left? Uh, they, it, right. You could even make that argument, sure, as, as I've tried to do. But the the real left that actually proudly describes itself as the left, I thought, oh, geez, they're worse than I thought. So I've been spending a lot of time on them. But for me, the the key thing that differentiates left and right. Now, I'm talking about authentic left and authentic right that makes me want to focus more on the left is that 
the left will take some abstract principle like equality, a, a word they'll never really define, which is great for them because then it gives them all the wiggle room they need to do whatever they want. And they will impose it in such a way as to try to bring about the revolutionary transformation of society all up and down its institutions. Whereas the right, you just don't see that kind of grandiose desire to remake society. A, a genuine conservative basically wants to maintain his own household, his own little neighborhood, his own little plot of land, his own little postage stamp of ground, as Bill Kaufman puts it. And he's satisfied with that. He does not have this far-flung desire to remake all of society. And you see this even in things like the Department of Education. You don't have a lot of right-wingers hoping to make their careers there because it just wouldn't occur to them. You know, Maybe they want to work at their local school or something. It just wouldn't occur to them to do this. But it's this imperial revolutionary transformation instinct and impulse that – makes people on the left want to insinuate their way into all these institutions. I don't see that threat from the right. No, I think that's right. And, and uh, you know, whether again, whether we look at the their attack on the family, which has certainly been ongoing since, uh, well, I guess we could say since Plato, but certainly since, since um, the French Revolution, since Karl Marx, they hate the family. They'd like to destroy the family. And I think the current day left is absolutely on board with that. Uh, they would like to destroy the family. So in this book, I try to, um, uh, moving from Mises and Rothbard, also Hoppe, I uh, try to show that th this war on the family is probably, maybe the most dangerous thing we face. Certainly it's it's a tremendous danger. And um, I think that uh, uh, Mises was right, Rothbard was right, that uh, the traditional family is the centerpiece of a free society and of, a, of our civilization. And the attempt to destroy the family is despicable and horrific and just extremely dangerous. I mean, they can actually destroy our civilization. There's a lot of stuff in here. Like the, you've got chapters on the family, on so-called um, civil rights, on, um, well, environmentalism too, but also immigration. There's a lot of controversial stuff, stuff that has divided uh, libertarians on which you're taking a very firm position. But you also have a chapter on economic egalitarianism, and that's something that hasn't really changed. I mean, some of the cultural stuff is really uh, of recent vintage because, as I've said on a number of times with Paul Gottfried on the show, the communists of <laughs> the 1950s and 40s were not looking to spread you know, personal liberation of various kinds. This would have been viewed by them as a bourgeois deviation. So that's relatively new. But economic egalitarianism is not new. I would say just right now the intensity of the push for it is greater than it's been probably, well, as long as I can remember. Uh, do you have any thought on, on what's pushing that? I mean, it could be people say, well, it's because capitalism has created inequality and everybody's upset about it. I mean, what do you think's going on here? Well, first of all, you know, I'd argue as, as both Mises and Rothbard and Hoppe uh, all say – there's something wrong with egalitarianism. There's something wrong with equality. It's a disastrous notion. And it's, it's uh, yes, they are absolutely are stepping it up, but it's always been a disastrous notion, even in the ancient world, certainly, again, in the French Revolution, uh, Karl Marx, all the communists, uh, they hold this up as, you know, as the great thing to get rid of in, in egalitarianism and uh, bring about egalitarianism, bring about equality. And I think it's it's just it's extreme it's extremely dangerous. And you know, Mises makes the point that the the key aspect of of human beings is our radical inequality. Uh, it's not that we're equal; we're radically unequal. And thank goodness, he says, because of course, then we if we weren't unequal, uh, then we wouldn't be able to have a uh, civilization. We wouldn't be able to have all the things that make a free society possible are uh, wrapped up in inequality. And so, the, you know, the left, the leftists are so vicious about wanting to bring about equality. And they are, this is Murray Rothbard, uh, of course, writes about this beautifully. And it's very, very dangerous. And I, I think that, uh, and, and hope that if people read this book, they'll agree that it's, it's something that is uh, horrifically dangerous to our civilization and to our society. I want to read a passage from the book, if I may. This is from the Economic Egalitarianism chapter, showing that this chapter goes beyond economics per se. And the passage runs as follows. And it's, it's a little bit lengthy, but I think it's worth the time. 
Robert Nisbet, the Columbia University sociologist, openly wondered if Rawls, and that's, of course, John Rawls, the 20th century American political philosopher, would be honest enough to admit that his system, if followed to its logical conclusion, had to lead to the abolition of the family. And here's what Nisbet says. I have always found treatment of the family to be an excellent indicator of the degree of zeal and authoritarianism, overt or latent, in a moral philosopher or political theorist. And then Nisbet goes on to identify two traditions of thought in Western history. One he traced from Plato to Rousseau that identified the family as a wicked barrier to the realization of true virtue and justice. The other, which viewed the family as a central ingredient in both liberty and order, he followed from Aristotle through Burke and Tocqueville. And then just continuing on, Rawls himself appeared to admit that the logic of his argument tended in the direction of the Plato slash Rousseau strain of thought, though he ultimately and unpersuasively drew back. And these are Rawls's words. It seems that when fair opportunity is satisfied, the family will lead to unequal chances between individuals. Is the family to be abolished then? Taken by itself and given a certain primacy, the idea of equal opportunity inclines in this direction. But within the context of the theory of justice as a whole, there is much less urgency to take this course. Well, Nisbet took little comfort in Rawls's pathetic assurances. Can Rawls, wondered Nisbet, long neglect the family given its demonstrable relation to inequality? Rousseau was bold and consistent where Rawls is diffident. If the young are to be brought up in the bosom of equality, early accustomed to regard their own individuality only in its relation to the body of the state, to be aware, so to speak, of their own existence merely as part of that of the state, then they must be saved from what Rousseau refers to as, quote, the intelligence and prejudices of fathers. Now, that is astonishing. I mean, Rawls is maybe the best-known, most celebrated 20th century American political philosopher, mm -hmm. and he can barely bring himself to <laughs> grudgingly concede that the family might be all right. Well, and my guess is he doesn't actually, he didn't actually believe that. I think he, you know, as Nesbitt hints, he didn't dare go there. He found it was, it was too scary a position for him to take in terms of his own career and his own standing. So I think that, you know, I, by the way, Robert Nisbet, of course, is a, was a great man. I've often wondered how the neocons managed to put up with him because there was a time when he was being promoted by the neocons, even though, of course, he himself was no neocon, and they were, they were promoting him. Now, of course, they've forgotten him now that he's, now that he's gone, but he's absolutely so worth reading and, uh, you know, what a, a tremendous intellect and, a, and a, just a tremendous man. And it's even more of a mystery, Lou, because he was so good on war, and he was saying that if you are a conservative, <laughs> what could be more disruptive to your society than than war and the military frame of mind and wanting a huge um, military establishment? So it is a mystery to me. I mean, it could just be he was the only sociologist with any common sense, and so that was it was slim pickets. I I don't know. Yeah, it's it's very interesting, and I'm I'm everybody should read some Robert Nisbet. He's just such a great writer and uh, such a great thinker and uh, unfortunately not remembered as much today as he ought to be. And uh, you've done a great job in, in making sure that people read him. And I'd like to join in with uh, your efforts in that regard. Well, start by reading, of course, uh, people should start by reading your book against the left. They'll read Nisbet kind of in context. They'll see why he's important just in the passages that, that you cite. Now, Rawls himself, uh, of course, is an egalitarian. And David Gordon, who's, of course, our good friend from the Mises <laughs> Institute, senior yeah. fellow there, uh, has said that it, he, he theorizes that, that the reason – now, we can, I don't know. We can't prove this. But R Rawls does believe in, in egalitarianism to the point where he can tolerate non-egalitarianism. He can tolerate unequal outcomes as long as this makes the poor better off. So in other words, if let's say we say that uh, the you know doctors get paid more than non-doctors, well, that's that leads to an, a, a non-egalitarian outcome, but at the same time, it makes the poor better off because more people are, are likely to become doctors under those conditions. And so we can allow that kind of inequality. But inequality has to be judged by its effects on the poor. Well, okay. Well, why would that stop at national borders, however? Like, why wouldn't this mean that 
all the third world countries shouldn't be brought up to first world level or first world countries brought down to the third world level. Uh, it would seem that that would require that. And Rawls is very unpersuasive as to why it wouldn't require that. And David Gordon's theory is he feels like he's going to lose the faculty lounges because the faculty, the professors will talk about inequality, <laughs> but doggone it, they want their wine and cheese receptions. <laughs> you know, they don't, so I don't know, right? <laughs> no, it's it's uh, David, of course, is is tremendous, and um, I think the great expert on Rawls and and uh, uh, why he's dangerous, why he's evil, and uh, why he's been so persuasive. Unfortunately, uh, especially on the uh, on the left. I mean, and he's had a, a bad effect like all the political, the left-wing political philosophers since Plato. What do you think, let's talk about the left libertarian problem for a minute, because that's a term that gets thrown around and some people are dubious about it or they just think, they think it's trying to find conflict where none exists. But I think it's important to talk about this. Now, there are a couple of ways you can define left libertarian, right? There's this technical definition that refers to people who have, certain economic views, like they think that in a purely free market, companies would tend to be smaller, you might have more worker-owned businesses than you have, things like that. Uh, but generally, colloquially, we use the term libertarian often to refer to libertarians who are eager, let's say, to follow the lead of the left culturally. Like wh whatever the left's demand is 15 minutes ago, they're on board. You know, like whatever it is that we're being commanded to do, they're going to do. And when the left says that people who don't go along with this should be demonized, these people are prepared to hop on board and demonize those people. Uh, how do you approach this in terms of explaining to, a, let's say, a total newbie to the libertarian movement who doesn't know the personalities and doesn't know the history, but just wants to know, what does this term left libertarian refer to? Well, it refers to people who uh, are, are leftists, as well as they claim also to be libertarians, but they're basically leftists. And um, this is a very unfortunate thing. They've had some influence, uh, I think a, a, not a tremendous amount of influence, but some influence, and it's been uh, a deleterious influence. And um, I think that, I think these are people who promote, first of all, egalitarianism. They promote just every every sort of thing the left promotes and, and all kinds of crazy stuff like... Uh, you wouldn't have companies owned by rich people that uh, um, all the all the employees would own the company and that sort of thing. So it's it's they have it's various left wing aspects that go into making a left libertarian, but they they hate the guts of the right libertarians, um, Hans Hoppe preeminently, but uh, all the rest of us, and they are um, determined to try to crush us. That couldn't, <laughs> that's not happened. I don't believe it will happen, but that's. That's what they want. They're 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 feminists. They're uh, for every kind of left wing thing that you can think of. And um, are they really there for libertarians? I I don't think so. Uh, but you know that's maybe something to be discussed in, in another book. Yeah, indeed, indeed. You know, I found and this is not absolutely true. It doesn't hold in every case. But if we think about, in particular, people in the D.C. orbit of uh, libertarianism who are especially eager to satisfy the left, you know, and to make sure they try and purge all the dissident voices in their ranks to make sure that the New York times understands we're not associated with those <laughs> people. We're just, we just want to talk about the tariffs are bad. You know, we don't want to talk about anything else. Like, uh, tariffs are bad and price controls are bad. You know, like, like, like we're living in 1873 or something like, like this is still what they think is the most important issue of the day. But what I also find like, for example, I know that the Libertarian Party is not at the forefront of your concerns, Lou, but but it is interesting to me that a lot of these Washington folks who are so eager to, let's say, demonize a guy like me, when it comes time to choose somebody for the Libertarian Party nomination, I always want the radical guy, you know? Like, I'm supposed to be the right-wing stuffed shirt. I always want the most <laughs> radical libertarian I can find. Whereas they want to choose the stuffiest shirt they can find. It is the weirdest thing. Th these are the ones who are, they're so chic and with it and culturally with it. And, and they're they're totally on board uh, with whatever the latest fashion is. But then they want the stuffiest shirt they can find. And I want the big radical. And likewise, it's like in the same way, it's like they have a certain soft spot for the regime for the establishment. And like, you can see that in 
it's they want to deny that there's a deep state or we're all crazy for speculating about that. And well, they just favor the rule of law and protecting whistleblower. I mean, oh come on, get off your high horse. You know, like it's like they love the regime. It's it's weird. Well, part of it is, of course, they they're funded by certain billionaires. Uh, Soros and the Kochs uh, are are cooperating in funding an alleged pro peace organization, although it's not actually, of course, that. So these people are all funded by these types, and um, that has to, that has to do with their with their position. So I think um, you know it's absolutely it's absolutely true that you know they love Bill Weld, for, you know, and they didn't they weren't at all upset when he endo- ended up endorsing Hillary Clinton the last time. So I'm sure they're going to promote something similar this time uh, with the Libertarian Party. And I you're right, I'm not that much concerned with the party, but. I'd still like to see it do the right thing. I'd like to see it be a Rothbardian Libertarian Party as it was originally. Um, but whether that happens or not, Tom, unless you run for office, I think that's not going to happen. Well, speaking I'm, of things that aren't going to happen. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'm <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. I don't want yeah. to wish that on you, believe me. No, no, no. I get it. I get it. Uh, you know, I want to see everybody become Libertarian. So I don't care where people start out as long as they wind up in the right place. But – at least in the people in my audience, I would say probably two thirds of them come from the right. And then maybe of the remainder, half of them were always libertarian. They were just born libertarians. Mm -hmm. And then the other half would be coming from the left. I mean, I do attract some people who come from the left and I'm not even really aiming my rhetoric at them, but one way or another, they, they do come over here. So we, we have people who come from all different backgrounds and I get people saying to me that it's easier to convert people, you know, on the left or people, it's easier to convert people on the right to libertarianism. In my experience, it's been easier to convert people on the right, but that may be because that's where I came from. And I know the, their errors really well. And I know the way they think, I know the way they talk. So that works for me. And people who come from the left, well, they can reach out to those people uh, somewhat more effectively. But I've had it said to me that, well, you can more, I've heard this, you can more easily teach the left economics then you can teach the right peace. And, you know, the the thing is, I think they're underestimating how hard it is to teach the left economics because (laughs) the right is actually, you know, there are parts of it that maybe, now, as soon as the next war is declared, they'll get their tiny American flags back out from storage and it'll be like nothing ever happened. But at least at the moment, you can get some of them to kind of think about it and admit it. And that's been the one thing that I do is I, I, I just say, think about your conservative principles and, and this foreign policy doesn't match up with them. And that actually, I am able to get them over. Whereas now the Democrats who I, I, I realize they're not the hard left by any means, although they increasingly are becoming that, but the Democrats are not even good on that one thing now anymore. So you would get bad economics and war. Ayn Rand uh, held that uh, uh, the best objectivists were came from the left. Uh, I'm not a big fan of objectivism, so that, that that doesn't bother me. I trust that she knew what she was talking about. But I think certainly libertarians, as she hated libertarians, of course, uh, the best libertarians come from the right. I don't think I don't think there's any question. Uh, but do we welcome people who are from the left? Of course, we welcome anybody who's who uh, has any views whatsoever if they're interested in libertarianism. We uh, we welcome them with open arms, but I think you know it's uh, the peace question. Ron Paul did such a tremendous job in uh, making sure that young people all over the world knew that it was okay to be for peace, and you didn't have to be a communist to be for peace. Not that the communists ever were for peace, of course, but the um, so I think Ron Paul has done it. You've done it, and I think there's a I, I think I see a real change that's taken place, and of course this is. This is one of the uh, the key components of libertarianism is the cause of peace. And I think that uh, I, I see a, a big change that's taken place. And uh, you and Ron and others have brought that about. Well, I appreciate that. I mean, Ron has was just, th- that's the thing he deserves to be remembered for the most, even more than the Fed and everything else. It's just not backing down on that. And then, you know, I'm sure being told by people close to him, you know, Ron, maybe tone down this war thing. Like we get it, you know, now it's time to talk about cutting spending. You're right. They, he was being told that. Yeah, I'm sure. I, I mean, why wouldn't yeah. he be? I could imagine advisors telling him that. And then 
you know, maybe you got to talk about cutting spending. And I, I imagine the conversation going something like, okay, I'll talk about cutting spending. And then the next time he sees out in public, it's, we got to cut defense spending. <laughs> you know? So, you know, he winds up doing it uh, uh, anyway. All right. So as I say, there's a, there's plenty of stuff in here that is, um, you know, that's been controversial among libertarians. And I remember a thing Ann Coulter said some time ago, and she said a word that I don't want to say on the podcast because actually I've gotten – I actually get people emailing me thanking me for keeping the podcast clean well, that's great. so that they they can play it with their kids in the car. you know. And once in a while, Lou, I want to say a bad word. Believe me, it is <laughs> really tempting. But I want people to be able to drive around with their five-year-old and not all day long the five-year-old is repeating some terrible word Woods said. Well, anyway, leaving that aside, I don't want to say the word that Ann Coulter said, but it's a word that starts with P, and it's five letters long, all right? And she was saying that libertarians basically are those things because, yeah, that sure, they want to talk all about legalizing pot because who doesn't, right? The, and that's very popular. But they don't want to talk about anti-discrimination law because that would be extremely unpopular with everybody who matters. And I thought that was actually a good point. People were all upset at her. I, Lou, I thought that was a very reasonable point for her to make, that as libertarians, we have to realize that we do say a lot of things that a lot of good, uh, honorable, decent people will agree with. Like we're anti-war, we're anti-surveillance, um, you know, we're anti-police abuse, we're, you know, we're anti-asset forfeiture, we're, you know, all, all these sorts of good things that a lot of people would sympathize with, we're for free speech and all that. But what comes with that also is... Yeah, sometimes we have to stand up and say, yep, at the same time, we are going to say things that are going to shock and scandalize you. But if you think them through, you'll see where we're coming from. And I think the issue of anti-discrimination law certainly is one of those. Well, of course, it's it's a very important issue. And um, it's something that libertarians, uh, left libertarians, of course, entirely rejected. But I would argue that all real libertarians, of course, understand that anti-discrimination law is horrific in a number of ways. And it's something that um, is not consistent with a free society. And the issue is not so much that we want people to put signs in front of their uh, establishment saying, you know, none of this such and such group can come in. It's basically nobody wants that. I mean, come on. I mean, other, other than hysterics who think that Americans are just one step away from wanting to ban, you know, this or that group from this or that place – Nobody really thinks that. I mean, nobody wants that. Nobody expects that to happen. It's more a question of, uh, let's say there's shoplifting going on in my store and I throw people out. But it turns out I didn't throw people out in the precise ratio or the precise <laughs> percentage that they are in the population. Then I could get the attorney general looking into my store as if I would have an interest in – Kicking, I want, especially a retail store today, they're desperate for money. They're not going to kick people out for no reason. You know, it's, it's interesting that in California and, excuse me, San Francisco and Los Angeles, in Boston and New York, uh, they've recently passed laws uh, saying that shoplifting uh, or just theft in period is fine as long as it uh, doesn't uh, go over $1,000. Uh, what? And, oh, can you? Yes, this is true. And so uh, there was this recent... Uh, uh, incident, and, and the New York Times wrote about this this uh, poor lady who was being a, was so terrible that she was being singled out. Uh, she was stealing people's Amazon packages from their porches, and uh, so the the article went on and talked about how this was terrible discrimination against her and so forth. And they never mentioned this fact that that it was now not illegal to steal things worth less than a thousand dollars. That just can't be. But it, I mean, it, is, it was true in New York and Boston. In Los well, Angeles the dollar store, San... dollar stores are in big trouble. I could take a <laughs> truckload of stuff out of the dollar store. <laughs> yeah, and of course, it's uh, you're not allowed to defend your store, and um, and we we know what happened to the the bakery in uh, Ohio where the the left wing college tried to put them out of business because um, they, there were black students who had stolen wine from the store, and the store uh, didn't like it, and they went after them. And this is, of course, this is a discrimination. It's vicious. It's horrible. And uh, this is this is the left. So it's the, again what they what they want, what they're wanting, what they're planning uh, makes everything that exists today uh, seem like heaven. So there, there's uh, terrible things they're planning, terrible things they're doing. It gets very little attention, 
And of course, uh, Seattle also has these laws and where uh, people can uh, go to the bathroom on the sidewalk and that's fine. And, and uh, all, all these cities have these laws and you're a vicious racist uh, if you disagree. So it's, um, it's, it, it's so important that we stick to our guns as far as private property, as far as uh, all the things that go along with, in a private property society, the, the sort that Hans Hoppe talks about. We have to be willing, uh, even though people are going to denounce us, we have to be willing to stand up for private property and for all the issues uh, that make a civilized society. And our, our civilized society is very much under attack. Uh, it's mostly coming from the left. And again, you have, you know, the neocons, although I, I would argue the neocons are from the, the left and not from the right, although they pretend to sometimes be from the right. Uh, but they're, they are leftists too. These are uh, horrific people. And of course, the, the, uh, uh, the surveillance state is basically a left-wing operation, although obviously there are right-wingers who support it. And these are people who have to be persuaded uh, or just kicked out of the kicked kicked out of civilized society if they promote these kinds of things. So really, we have our work cut out for us. Um, but I think there's no question we have the truth on our side. We have the uh, the correct positions on our side, and we just have to work harder uh, and try to spread libertarianism, the right sort of libertarianism, which. Uh, uh, I know Hans Hoppe feels his right libertarianism, uh, my own position. And I, I know Walter Block uh, wrote me and he said, Lou, your next book needs to be against the right. And I, I said, no, well, no, Walter, uh, it doesn't have to be uh, because I think that uh, the left is the problem. The left is the basic problem. And um, yes, we should criticize the right when they're wrong, absolutely, and try to persuade them. Uh, but I think the left is the people who would like to kill us uh, they'd like to put us in concentration camps. They have no end to the, their ambitions for a totalitarian society. And so it's, it's up to us to fight them. And uh, the Republicans are, of course, by and large, no good. Democrats are, by and large, entirely evil. But we have to stick to our guns. We have to understand the basic principles of libertarianism. We have to understand the great people who are our, our, our ancestors whether it's uh, you know Mises and Rothbard especially, but Nisbet and many other great men and women too. And um, everything good is at stake. So I think we need to work very hard. And um, you know, you're preeminent in this and what you do. And uh, I would say we all should try to be Woodsians to the extent it's possible for us. That's very kind of you to say, Lou, although we should be Lou Rockwellians, uh, first and foremost, let's say. Well, before I let you go, one last thing. Let me see if I can pick your brain on this a little bit. I think there is a difference between a committed ideological leftist and somebody who by default goes on the left because you know they're raised in a kind of left-wing milieu and they think that being on the left just means you care about the downtrodden. Now, the ideological leftist, it's very, very, very hard to reach. But the, the second kind... Uh, is reachable, and and plenty of those people have become libertarians. Is there a way that you can speak to them, uh, even as somebody who might identify himself as a right libertarian, that you can speak to them that might make them think differently? Well, I think it I think it is possible, and of course, if if one is concerned about, as you say, the downtrodden, uh, we have to look at who's who's trotting them down. Uh, it's the state, and uh, if the the statists get their way poor people get, get doubly downtrodden. So I think that, yes, it's, it's, we can talk about uh, free market society making everybody better off. So I think that's, that those are important points to make too. So yes, uh, absolutely, we can do that. Well, the book is called Against the Left of Rothbardian Libertarianism. I'm linking to it on the show notes page, which is tomwoods.com slash 1529. And of course, you should be checking out lourockwell.com every day as I do and as Ron Paul does, lourockwell.com, which has been our flagship site for going on 20 years. Is it over 20 years, Lou? <laughs> it's, uh, it's almost 20 years, yes. Wow. Do you remember the exact month or, or like when it was? It was in uh, November 1999. Okay. So at, at most it's days away, 20 years of LRC. That's that's amazing. I'm sure some I'm sure the libertarian institutes 
uh, that we find around the country will be having a big celebration <laughs> to commemorate that. And the party, too. Yes, of course, of course. That's indeed, indeed. Well, look, I'll, on behalf of all the good libertarians out there, I'll say a big thank you to you, Lou, for all the great work you've done over the years, including this book. Thanks so much. Thank you, Tom. All right, folks, if you have not yet subscribed to The Tom Woods Show, make sure and do so at tomwoods.com slash apple, and all these episodes will be delivered automatically to your device. And just think of how much smarter you'll be if you keep on listening to The Tom Woods Show. I'll see you tomorrow. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit tomwoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time. Like the sound of The Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at podsworth.com.